Shout to shake the sky, lift up a cry, be glorified. The King is coming in. The King is coming in. Oh yes. Well, let's dance like nobody's looking today. Let's sing like we've never sang it before. Amen. That's what Jesus said to me today. Here we go. Let's dance. We will dance. We will dance for Your glory. We will dance. We will dance. For your glory, we will dance. For your glory, oh, 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 oh. we will lift up a shout to adore you. Every sound that we make, it is for you. We will dance for your glory, Lord. Salvation has come. Salvation's in this place. You're the name by which we're changed, Jesus. Shout to shake the sky. We lift up a cry, be glorified. Jesus, the King is coming in. We're the people, amen. Here we go. We're the people of God with a song to sing, and we're singing our song. It's an offering. We will dance for your glory. Cross is the hope that we hold up high as we tell the whole world your love and life. We will dance for your glory. Let's declare it again, people. The people of God. We're the people of God. We've got a song to sing. We're bringing our song as an offering. We'll dance for your glory, Lord. Yes. And your cross is the hope that we hold up high. We tell the whole world of your love and life. We will dance for your glory, Lord. Lift up your heads, you ancient gates. We lift up. Oh, the King is coming in. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We lift up a shout to shake the sky. Lift up a cry before us. Just rejoice a minute. That's what it's all about anyway. Jesus. 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 You're the Lord Lamb. Lamb, Lord of all. Yes. Lord of all. Victor and victory.
Lift your hands up. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. We declare it. I am chosen, not forsaken.
that's all my condition. Sing this with me now. You had a plan from the start. You were son for redemption. The price for my heart. I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand. I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. I run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Before my first breath, running into your arms is running to life from death. And I feel this rush deep in my chest. Your mercy is calling me just as I am. You pull me in, and I know that I. after me, Lord, truth is, you're running after us, you're running, you're running after me, oh, oh, oh. you're running to meet us, we're running to find us, we're running to love us. are yours first we are yours lord and you're loving us we are yours you are ours lord you are ours lord we're running after running after you we're running after your love is changing me lord
a clap of praise this morning. We're going to take up this morning's offering and dismiss the kids. They continue to sing, build my life. Can you hear me? I'm here, fighting, pressing to remember what you said. But this onslaught of thoughts fills my head with dread and I need you. Like enemies encamped, shrouded in the dark, I can feel the fascination of too many temptations reaching for my heart. So I need you to hear me. For I know your ears are attentive to the righteous and I know that your ways are certain. Even when my worries would trample me to dust, still, I know you are good. Your hand is just. So come now, be the salvation for my sins. Help me to begin again that you would mend this trend of hopelessness. God, deliver me in my brokenness. I can feel your presence, even now in the ugly, in the mess that has been made. You surround me with your benevolence. Yes, your love is on display, and I can see it. Carving roads through the struggles and the troubles, past temptations and devices that seek to choke me out. So come fear, come failure, come opposition or doubt. Jesus, you are my deliverance. Your grace is sufficient. Trusting you is my only way. Now I turn my mind to dwell on your truth. Curate the condition of my heart to manifest joy. Be my living proof. Subdue the haters, quell the voices inside, transform me, Lord, extinguish my pride. You've won the battle, I trust in your plans. Yes, God, I surrender all my worries, my woes, and my demands into your eternally capable hands. is sufficient, not for just me, but for all of us. You know, sometimes you just have one of those weeks where you need more of his grace than other weeks. Well, I've had one of those weeks where I needed more of his grace. 
where I had to listen to, to his voice a little bit more last week. It was a tough week. If you're here for the first time and you haven't been here in a long time, I, I welcome you here. Uh, we, have, we have a saying right here that says, you belong. So turn to your neighbor and tell them you belong. Now turn to your other neighbor and tell them you belong. You belong here. Jesus is doing something in this place. Jesus is moving in this house. And a couple weeks ago, I started a, ser- a sermon series, and some of y'all may remember the end times. Y'all remember that? One of you did. Two of you did. Okay, do you remember a couple, three weeks ago to be exact, we started the end times? Raise your hand if you remember. There you go. Some of you do. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day that you have made. And God, I ask you to touch hearts, you to touch lives, God. And Lord, you would speak through your word, God, because your word never returns void. And I give you thanks and I give you praise. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Turn your Bible through to 1 John 3. We're going to read verses 1 to 3. And I'm going to go over what I started three weeks ago because I'm on scene four. There was five scenes, and I'm on scene four, but let's, let's just start in 1 John 3, 1 through 3. And I want you to really get what Jesus did for us. If you don't get nothing today, get what Jesus did for you on the cross. You get nothing else. Jesus died for you. You was to die for He loves you so much. He adores you so much. John, 1 John 3, 1 through 3 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that because he does not know him. Remember last week? I believe it was Wednesday and Sunday, somebody shared, you may know of God, but but do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? Do you really know him? Or do you know of him? Is it up here? Or is it right here? Verse 2, dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And all who have his hope in him purifies themselves just as he is pure. And I shared this three weeks ago. Bible prophecy is not to scare us, but it is to prepare us. Eschatology is what I'm talking about. All that means is a big word. I get it. But all it means is the end times. That's all it means. Or end time events. I believe it can all also motivate us. First John says, He that is the hope that is the coming of the Lord's return purifies himself, even as he is pure. I believe talking about the end times can be very motivating. I can tell you today that Ernesto is motivated because when I shared with him that one day Jesus says in his word he's coming back on a cloud and every time it's cloudy he'll send me a text, hey today's cloudy (laughs) and I told y'all a couple weeks ago that when it's a clear beautiful day like it is this morning, man this morning was clear, it was beautiful, It it was cool in the morning. And I was outside thinking, thank you, God, for this wonderful day. And I know the day you're not coming back, I don't see any clouds. <laughs> Beware, though. That cloud could come in at any moment. <laughs> it will keep us on our toes spiritually if we eagerly await his appearance. Some of you need to be kept on your toes. I know I do. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 says, But I do not want you to be ignorant. That word there, ignorant, doesn't mean you're stupid. It means that you're unlearned. So today I'm going to share some things with you 
And I'm going to help you understand what the end times is. And I'm not scared of the end times. Because I know who I belong to. I know whose I am. Being a brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, least to sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with them those who sleep in Jesus. Verse 15. For this we say to you, that by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why do you say, why does the Bible say that? Because they need a six-foot head start. They in the ground. It's a joke. Okay. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That word caught up. Somebody says, and, I, and this is where we started two or three weeks ago. The word rapture is not in the Bible. The Bible, the word Bible is not in the Bible. The Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The word Trinity is not in the Word. But we know it's there. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity. Do you believe that? Okay, you're on the same page, right? Okay, caught up in the strong 726 is the word harpazo. That means to be taken up by force, to be plugged, to be caught up. It's the same word. It's the same word as rapture. So even though sometimes there's not exact wordings that some of us are just wanting to see, well, rapture's not in the Bible. Yes, it is. It's how you look at it. You have to, you have to study. And I have studied this. And caught up, harpazo in the Greek, is the same thing as being taken away. Caught up, rapture. Okay, so I started three weeks ago. Scene one was God in paradise with mankind. You believe that? You remember that? It was in, it was in Genesis, and it's in Revelation. So it starts out with God and man in paradise. Guess where it ends up? God and man in paradise. We are his children. I like to call us the bride of Christ. Some of you don't like the word bride of Christ. We are his church. We are his children. When you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, you became saved. That is your eternal, your eternal reward. It's heaven. It's to be with Jesus. I want to be with Jesus. I don't want to go to hell. I want to be with Jesus. The Bible talks about hell where there's weeping and there's gnashing of teeth. I don't want anything to do with that. Remember, we talked about somebody hurting so bad that their teeth gnash. I have seen that. Now, the military guys, I've talked to you, Bob, and some other guys. Y'all have seen people hurt so bad their teeth sit there and just gnash. And I learned when I was seven years old, I didn't want nothing to do with that place. And I should have got at least one amen out of that one. Oh, okay. All right, I got at least one. All right. And then scene two, does anybody recall what scene two was? Scene two was mankind rebelled. Remember that? Remember, God only values, you, values a consensual relationship. See, he gave you your own free will. So you can do whatever you want to do. Bubba can go do whatever Bubba wants to do. But I got news for you, there's consequences in everything that I do. There is consequences in everything that I say. There is consequences on how I act and how I talk. Me and Sharon was talking this morning. Who are you really when you're by yourself? <laughs> what you're thinking when you're thinking? Remember, y'all recall that series? Think about what you're thinking about when you're thinking about it? Who are you when you're by yourself? You have to answer for it. There's consequences in life. But God values you as a consensual relationship. What does that mean? That means that he will in, invite you. He will call you with his loving kindness. And it's up to you to accept it or reject it. He values that. That was scene two. Scene three was Jesus redeems mankind 
and reveals a mystery. We talked about how he loves you so much he came and died for us. The mystery was the Jewish wedding. Y'all recall that? I talked about that. Okay, that was pretty neat. We also talked about it is grace you have been saved. That's a gift of God. That's my gift. That's your gift. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. What am I at? Scene three? Or was that scene three? Okay, scene three also told you to write down a, a word in the Greek called paralambano. Y'all remember that? I told y'all to write that word down. P A R A. L-A-M-B-A-N-O, para Lombano. And we'll get to that shortly. All right. Scene four. Here we are today. Are y'all ready for scene four? The gospel is preached around the world and people decide for Christ or against Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm going to believe everybody sitting in this church today is for God. Now, if you're not saved today, you can be saved before you walk out them doors. You can know without a shadow of a doubt if you die when you walk out the door, where you're going. I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. Mm. So I'm glad morning. When this life is over, I'm going to fly away. Jesus came to redeem us of our sins through his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross and to also reveal to us that we are his future. I like to call us our bride. Some of you don't like that word bride. The to reveal his future church or his people. I still like bride. I don't know about you, but it's how I am. So now the gospel has been preached for over 2,000 years around the world. There are 8 billion people in the world today. Little under 2 billion claim to be Christians. 6 billion refuses and rejects Christ. Now, I believe that a lot more will, will get saved during the tribulation. The Bible says there will be 144 evangelists, Jewish, and they're going to be on fire for God, and they're going to set people free, and they will become saved. I believe hundreds of millions, if not billions, will get saved during that time. The rapture of the church is where we will disappear in that greatest evangelistic event is going to happen. It's going to happen. A lot of people is going to get saved. And most of them will be killed by the Antichrist. Or they'll die in the, in the judgment. Three quarters of the earth's population will die during the tribulation. And so you say, why would anybody reject Jesus? The gospel is being preach, people have to make and are making their, their decision to follow Christ. Jesus is trying to delay to give people an opportunity to receive him during that time. Jesus answers this question in John as to why they reject him. Most of you know John 3.16, but let's go ahead and turn to John 3.16, and I'm going to read all the way to 21. Everybody knows John 3.16, but very few of us know 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 by heart. Some of you do. I'm not one of them. I know John 3.16. I'm going to start there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see that might? Because there's going to be those who say no to Jesus. 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does, does not believe is condemned already. So before you came to Christ, guess where you were going? Simple. You were condemned. Going to... I think I heard somebody say H H E double hockey stick. That's where you be going if you don't know Jesus. Do you know Jesus this morning? Oh, come on. Do you know him? Do you really know him? All right. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Do you know anybody like that? Men love darkness rather than light. Do you know anybody like that? I do. For everyone practice, practicing evil hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Because what does light do? It exposes things. But he who does who does the who he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. See, unfortunately, we have a choice. We have to make a choice. Do I come into the light so my, my moral my behavior can be scrutinized? Where I can come under authority and be accountable to the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Or do I stay in darkness? See, a lot of men like to just stay in darkness because they don't want anything exposed. So they'll just hide there. The kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of rebellion, lawlessness, and darkness where men does not want their behavior scrutinized and they don't want a higher authority. Anybody ever known somebody like that? That they it? You ain't going to tell them nothing? You ain't going to show them anything? Because they it. They are. They do not want any authority. They're as high as, as anybody. But my Bible says, and your Bible says, that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I don't care who it is. It could be Adolf Hitler. He's going to bow down and confess that Jesus is Lord. It can be Ben Laden. He's going to bow down. He's going to confess I can promise you that every president of the United States one day will bow down and say, Jesus is Lord. It's in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. No one is excluded, even you, even me. And I don't mind because my God's been good to me. And I don't mind bowing down. I don't mind confessing that Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my King who I live for. So you're either going to do it willingly or you're going to do it unwillingly. And for some some of you, it's going to be too late because you've already rejected him. That's the sad part. Remember, consensual relationship is what Jesus wants. He'll invite you. He's an open door. But you're the one that has to say, yes, God, I want more of you. And I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. Scene five, Jesus returns for his bride in the midst of an evil generation. Some of you might say he ain't coming for his bride, he's coming for his church. Same thing. His church, his people. This brings us current. This is where we are today. And I promise you, Jesus is about to return for us in the midst of an evil generation. Turn your Bibles to Luke 17. I'm going to read 17 through 30. Luke 17. Start me verse 22. When you're there, say I'm there. Okay. You're there. Then he said to to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. That is talking about the rapture. But first he must suffer many things, and be rejected by this generation. 26, and it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. 28, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. 
They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on that day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30, even so it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus talking about one day. A day in history when Noah got on the boat before the flood, there was buying, selling, marrying, giving in, in, in marriage. The day Lot went out of Sodom and Gomorrah, this is important. We will not be here, guys, when this happens, in, in my opinion. Jesus will come and take us all away from a tribulation. Buying, selling, marrying, giving in to marriage, planning, building. At the end of tribulation, three quarters of the population is going to be dead. Now, some people will have to go through it, uh, the uh, tribulation. But the earth is going to be smoldering. See, he says he's going to destroy the earth again by what? Fire. So this earth at that time is going to be smoldering. It's going to be in ruin. There's not going to be any buying, selling, marrying, giving to marriage. If I tell you the end of the world is going to come in six months, let's, let's build a house, let's get married, let's go buy, let's go sell. See, that all speaks of what? A future and a hope. At that time, there's not going to be any future or a hope. Noah was building this huge boat. And I got news for you. There was not a, a trailer sitting beside that boat that he can just load it up and he go to the lake. It didn't happen. He was ridiculed. They're like, Noah, what are you doing? You're building this big old thing for what? It's never rained. Oh, but he looked like a genius when it started raining. Didn't he? He was mocked, ridiculed. Angel said to Lot, you have to get out of there because we can't judge this place until you are gone and you have safely arrived at your destination. Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you all remember that story? Remember that story? Okay. The judgment of the world will not begin until we are out of here. I really believe that. And by the way, Noah's days, there was wickedness, violence, immorality. In Lot's days, there was rampant immorality and rejection of God's authority. Does that sound like where we are, at, where we are living in today? I need everybody to answer this question. Does that sound like that's where we're living today? It does to me. There is a righteous remnant who is obeying God and waiting for God. And he said it would be just like that at the end days. He wants people who are eagerly waiting his return. In Luke 17, 34, it says, I tell you, in that night, there will be two, in fact, y'all turn there. If you're still in Luke 17, go to verse 34. I really want you to see this with your eyes. It's going to be on the board too. But I tell you that in that night there will be two men in bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. That is describing the rapture or the catching away. Two men or two women will be grinding together. There will be one taken and one left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and one left. And, the, and they answered and said, said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Some of you are like, What does that mean? In other words, the air where, where the eagles are, that's where we're going to be caught up. That would make you happy. Okay, paralambano. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that word? Okay, Strong's 3880, it means to receive. See, Jesus said he's going to receive us. It's the same word as taken. 
take it and receive is per, perlabata. Receiving, I'm going away to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And as surely as I go, I will come back and receive you to myself. So where I am, maybe also you will be there. So where I am, you may be also. The word taken. Taken, one taken, one left behind. But they were taken. That's the same word as receive. The rapture. Jesus, Jesus is coming from his father's house. Okay? Heaven. To earth to receive to receive us to himself. To receive. And take us back to his father's house. There's going to be a seven year period of time where we're going to be with Jesus. A seven solid years. It's like a marriage where his church ends up with him for seven years. That's what I'm waiting for. That's what you should be wait, waiting for too. This is the the next biggest event is, is, is about to happen. It's going to happen, guys, right before our eyes. It's scriptural. If you believe the word of God, like I do, we need to be waiting, eagerly waiting. The, the days of Noah, the days of Lot, the days of wickedness, the days of, of rebellion. These days, God is being mocked right now. I hear it all the time. People are always mocking my God. And saying how he's not real. And how this ain't going to happen. Y'all are all stupid. We all come up from monkeys. No, I did not. My Bible says I was fearfully and wonderfully made. We was knitted together in our, in our mother's womb. And he has so many thoughts for us while we were still in our mother's womb that they can't be counted. That's my God. So I said all this now. Don't stop living your life. Just believe that Jesus is coming back soon. So go ahead and build a house, get an education, get a degree, get married, have some babies. Plan like he's not coming back for 100 years, but live like he's coming back today. Do you get that? Okay, you can, you can plan your life just, just like you are now. You live every day. You make plans. You go to work. Make it happen. You just make things happen. But you live like it's coming back. You wait for him. Live your life. Pray for direction. Number one is always seek God. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And I got news for you. Jesus will be on time. Some of you go, well, I want to get married, Hannah. I want to have 13 babies, and I want to do this. I promise you, you will not regret when Jesus comes back. Some of you are not going to say, man, I wish I'd have went to the prom. It's not going to happen. Y'all are going to be so excited that Jesus came, is coming back. Okay, that was, that was the five scenes. Now we're going to go to part two. This is where it's going to get pretty deep, so you, get, you might need to pay a little closer attention. If I don't get through with this today, I'm not going to finish it next week. I'll finish it the week after next. The reason why? Because we got Mama's Day next week to celebrate, and we're going to celebrate our mamas. I'm going to celebrate my mama. I'm going to celebrate my wife and my mother-in-law. And I'm going to celebrate all of you guys, all of you ladies who are mothers, because without you, there would be no me. Now, I could say the same thing about my dad, but it takes two. Okay. The Bible tells us what is going to happen at the end time. It's happening right, right before our eyes. Signs of the times, real events. Some of you would like to know, well, what is going on with Russia or Ukraine? There's not very much in the Word of God that talks about Ukraine, but there is tons that talks about Russia and Israel. And I want to ask and answer three questions. Number one question, 
How do we know we are living in the end time? You want to write that down? Go ahead. How do we know we are living in the end time? Just about every generation of Christians since Jesus had believed they are living in the end time. Famines, earthquakes, and wars. So how do you know? Glad you asked. Joel chapter 3 is a very important passage and that, and that this is God speaking through his prophet Joel. Turn in the Bible to Joel 3, 1 and 2. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into the judgment with them there. Jehoshaphat means Jehovah has judged. I'll say it again in just a second. What he's saying is, on my account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the, the nations. They have divided up my land. And God is saying here, the time I bring back captives of Judah and Jerusalem, that's also going to be the start of Armageddon. You ever heard of that? Armageddon? All right. It's going to be in the same time period when he brings back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem from all over the world and the nation of the world, there's going to be Armageddon. I'm to bring all nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat, I'm going to tell you again, it means Jehovah has judged. Jehoshaphat is the valley between the Mount of Olives and the uh, uh, Temple Mount. And that is where Jesus' feet will touch the Mount of Olives when he returns according to Zechariah 14. That is scriptural. It says his feet will touch the Mount of Olives when he returns. Zechariah 14 so this, the battle of our Armageddon, Israel is the nation. Israel has been dispossessed twice. Do you, do you know what that means? Dispossessed, they have lost their, their nation. Bible says, and that's why God was mad, because you have scattered them. He was mad about that. He still is. They have been dispossessed twice. And they have came back to be a nation. First time happened in 500 B.C. Because of their sin, God allowed the uh, Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, to de defeat the Jews. They took them captive from, from, from Israel and took them to uh, Babylon. While they were in, in Babylon, Persian, uh, Persia uh, defeated uh, Babylon. And that became... Persia. So at the end of the 70 years, they were able to go back and literally uh, revive their nation. And, and that was the first time. And, and they only went back from that nation from where they were taken, uh, Babylon. Second time Israel was dispossessed was in A.D. 70. Jesus prophesied this in Luke 21. In A.D. 70, the Roman, Roman general Titus, with a Roman a legion, came and defeated the Jews, killed over a million Jews, and destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed of the temple, and raised the, uh, the temple mount, and took the remaining Jews hostage. They took them captive back to Rome, so they were ultimately scattered all around the world. So God is saying, you have scattered my people all over the world, but I'm going to regather them. And that happened on May 14th of 1948. Israel became a nation. 1948, it came into existence for the second time. Isaiah 11, God said, I will again for the second time Take my hand and regather my people from all nations 
So they have been dispossessed twice. They have come back to life twice. That's unheard of for a nation to be not a nation, to come back a nation. But on May of 1948, the British mandate ended. David Ben-Gurion, the leader of Israel, declared their independence. On the same day, our president, Harry Truman, recognized Israel as a nation. And there was other nations, too, that recognized Israel is a nation. Literally in one day in May. Tell you what, May is a good month. My wife was born in May. May of 1948, Israel became a nation. This is Isaiah 66, 8. Who has heard such things? Who has, who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to be given birth in one day or shall a, shall a nation be born at once for as soon as Zion was in labor she gave birth to her children the rebirth of Israel on May 14th 1948 that prophecy was fulfilled man you already get shook up about that you see prophecy has to be fulfilled because Jesus comes back and Jesus is not going to come back until he said what? Until Israel becomes a nation. Israel became a nation in 1948, May 14th. They will celebrate their 74th year anniversary as a nation again. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 32 and 34. Matthew 24, 32 and 34. Now learn this is a parable from a fig tree. When its branches had already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know summer is near. So you also, when you should see all things, okay, he's talking about the end times here, guys. You got that? See things, know that it is near at the doors. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven, verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will by no means pass away. So Jesus is saying, y'all listen to this. The generation when Israel becomes a nation, this generation will see the beginning from the end. That's scripture. That's what Jesus just said. That gen now, what's the generation? Well, if you go to Psalm 90, verse 10, 70 years. Ten more years, reason to shrink. Eighty years, right? I'm not putting any dates on when Jesus is coming back. Because the Bible says no man knows when he's coming back, nor the hour, nor the day. But think about this. If 80 years is a generation, Israel celebrating their 74th year anniversary. Well, 74 from, uh, from 80, six years. Now, I'm not saying it's coming back in six years because I don't know when a generation in God's mind is. I know what the Bible says, and the Bible will interpret the Bible. In Psalms 90, verse 10, a generation, your life, you are guaranteed 70, you're promised 70 years here on earth, 10 more reason to strength. Do you agree with that? Most of you do? Okay. Well, I believe in Jesus' mind. He says that generation will see the beginning from the end. So in my mind, when that generation was from 1948, that generation is going to see the beginning from the end. That's scriptural. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying, that's what the Bible says. Every, every generation has had signs. Every, every generation has had earthquakes, famines, pestilence. Every 
generation has had some kind of an evil leader or person who they thought could even be, you know, the Antichrist. I've heard it. Some of y'all have too. Well, that's just you know, the Antichrist. That guy's the Antichrist. I've heard it all my life. And so have y'all. That's every generation. But we are the only generation that has had the existence of Israel. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. That is what makes us different, that Israel is now a nation. Israel has to exist for dozens of end-time prophecies to come true. For there to be a covenant with the Antichrist in Israel, they have to exist. For the abomination of desolation to take, pli- to take place, Israel has to exist. Abomination of, of desolation, I don't have time today to explain that. Look that up on your own. That's a whole other sermon. The temple has to be rebuilt. Two witnesses has to come to be in existence of for Israel. So Israel Israel has has to exist, and they have existed since 1948. Jesus said, "The generation that that sees these things will see all things fulfilled." He said. So I'm going to bring back Israel. He's back. Armageddon is going to happen. You know, seven years is not long. I was reading that Psalm 90 verse 10, and I think I, I, don't, I don't like that scripture because I'm 58. And if I do the math, I don't have long, I don't have a long time to live. This time is short. The Bible says life is but a vapor. Is anybody ever seen a vapor? What's this? That's how long your life is. It's but a vapor. It's here one day and gone the next. Yeah. Man, I got ahead of myself. I got excited. Y'all just hang, y'all hang tight. God has basically said, I am mad, and I am, I am mad for two reasons. One was the way that they treated my people. He's talking about the Jews. The other one, the reason why he's mad is how we scattered them around the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. We divide up my land. See, God calls the nation of Israel his land. That's why God tells us in his word to pray for Israel. And we do that. And Israel is about the size of the state of New Jersey. That's how small it is. It's it's a tiny nation. If you was to put Israel in Lake uh, Michigan, there there, would be room left over. That's how small they are. It's a tiny nation in the Middle East. And we have been a dividing up its land since 1948, since, since they got there. There is a book that I'm going to buy, and it's called Eye to Eye by William Conan. And his title of this book, a subtitle of this book, is called Facing the Consequences Consequences of Dividing Israel. In that book, there's 126 examples where the U.S. and NATO has tried to force Israel to give up land. And every time that has happened, there has been a natural disaster somewhere else. I want to give you two examples. 2005, the U.S. and 
of NATO under the George Bush administration, <coughs> administration forced Israel to give up the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is a tiny piece of land on the Mediterranean Sea. It's a very lucrative piece of land. But the Palestinians think that it's theirs. And what they said is that if you'll give us this land, that we'll give you peace. So guess what Israel did? They gave up the land. They didn't get no peace. They still don't have no peace. For, for now, they are shooting rockets off of that, that strip. Five days later, a hur hurricane of Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. Five days later. Is, some of you say that's a coincidence. Bull. I don't believe that for a minute. God says he's mad because he's dividing up my land. Hurricane caused historic damage. It was the worst natural disaster in American history at that time. Immediately, Jewish rabbis came out and, and said, that is what God does because you made us give, give up the Gaza Strip. Second one, December 2020, 2021, there was a 230-mile tornado that hit the USA. Y'all remember that? It was an F4 tornado, powerful tornado. It hit four states in four hours. With the most of its damage happened in the state of uh, Kentucky. Historic damage. Why was this happening? In Israel at that time, the Biden administration, and I am not talking about politics. I don't do that. My Bible says to pray for them. I'm just stating the fact. I'm not, I'm not, this is not the politics. I will never speak politics. My Bible says to pray for them. And I do that. Pray for your leaders. And we will do that. But what was going on at that time? The Biden administration at the exact time was trying to force Israel to stop building 9,000 houses in a settlement in east of Jerusalem. Because the Biden administration does not recognize east of Jerusalem as belonging to the Jews. They think it belongs to the Palestinians. And they were trying to pressure them to give up east of east Jerusalem. Golan, Golan Heights, you ever heard of that? They're on the West Bank. They were trying to stop all that happened because that is where we want to put a embassy in, in that same area. God is saying, I'm mad. I'm ticked off. Can you tell you why I'm mad? I'm mad because of how you treated the Jews. I'm mad because you're, you're dividing my land. This is current. T today, in fact, it's about three, three, three weeks ago, there were 600 Oh, Ukrainian Jews flew back to Israel. Immigrants all over are going back home to Israel. Remember God said he's going to uh, gather them all back? That's what he's doing right, right now. He's uh, gathering them back. When the Iron Curtain fell in 1991, 1.1 1 .1 million Jews immigrated from Russia back to Israel. 
Since 1948, the Jews have been coming back home from all over for the world. And that's what God said exactly what would happen. Israel is God's super sign and stopwatch related to the end times. Everything starts there and everything ends there. Armageddon is going to end there. World War III, Armageddon. Number two, what is the significance of what's happening in Russia right now? I, I just told you earlier that Ukraine, I don't, I don't really feel is a prophetic. Russia is. It's highly a prophetic. And Russia plays a major role in the end time, according to God's word. Ezekiel 38, 39 gives prophecy that tells us where Russia will be and what Russia will do in the end time. Ezekiel 38, 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. Rosh is Russia. Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh. Meshach and Tubal. Verse 4, I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with all your armies, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with a bucklers, shields, and all uh, of them handling swords. Anybody ever seen a a hook for a mule, it's a jaw hook. You ever seen that? When, when a mule is stubborn and he don't want to go somewhere, they will put this hook in his jaw and they will lead him around. That's what God's going to do to God. Russia is going to put a hook in his, in his jaw. I can't wait to see that. Maybe. If I'm here. Verse 5. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them. All of them. With shields and helmet. Gomer and all his troops. The house of... I don't know how to say that word. Gomorrah. From the north. Remember that phrase. From the north. And all his troops. Many people are with you. Who's the players? Let's talk about them. This man is named God. And I believe he is the leader of Russia. God says here you're, that you are to prophesy against this man, leader, and tell him, I am against you. I am going to put a hook in your jaw like an animal, and I am going to lead you around. He's telling that guy, you are not in charge. You, you may think you're in charge, but in the end, it's God, Jesus, who's in charge. He's saying, Russia, you're not going to make the decision, but I am. He's, he's telling them that I am in a control. Of Putin Gog? I don't know. But it could be. But I would say that he is. Now, if this is going to happen in the future, then no, it's not. But I don't know that. I'm just telling you what, what I'm reading out of, out of the Word of God, what I'm seeing going on in the world. But the leader is going to be a very e evil man and I think that he is. He has bombed a places just almost every, every day. Women, the children, a nursing home, schools. That's, 
That's evil, guys. It, yeah, that is just, that's just flat out mean. A moth killing everybody inside? That's evil. That, that just breaks my heart. And I don't think that Ukraine is of the end game for him. I really don't. I think once he gets through with that, he's going to keep on going. And that's when we're going to have to get, get, get involved. That's when the West gets involved. And I believe that's when it's going to start. It's War World III. I have, I have looked at uh, our military, or the, our generals, and I think that they're getting ready for something big. He wants to reform the entire Soviet Union. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to get a big old powerhouse. He's trying to get more land, get more uh, resources, so he could just keep on going. But God is against God, leader of Russia, Mishal Stevens. I got a map. Trey, I, did, did you ever get those up? Map one. I have some maps. I'm just going to just kind of show you of the area. And if I can get it up or not. There you go. Israel. It's tiny. It's right there. That's how small it is. Here is his list. Rosh, Mish, Meshach, Atubal. Here's a map. Go to map two. I think there's a, yeah, there it is. That, that's the right map. Where the uh, a circle is, it's Israel. Remember the term far, far north? Remember when I told you? From the north. The Bible always gives a direction from uh, Jerusalem. When the Bible says north, it's always north of what? Jerusalem. It states south. It'd be south of what? Jerusalem. If you're going to come from the far north from to Jerusalem. So if you start from Jerusalem and you go straight up north, what do you hit? Russia. Go to map, map two. Sir, that is two. Okay, never mind. Russia is at the top of the map. You'll notice that Ukraine is there to the left. Biblically, that could be a part of Russia, but I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing. But that that that's possible. Map three, Trey. May, Magog is equal 38. Today is the stand close. I don't see the stand close. Go to map, try three, Trey, or four. There's your a stand close. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, all the... There, there's all the stands. And uh, today, that Magog is the modern day uh, Turkey. To the left is put. Uh, go to your next, I think, map four or five, Trey. Nope. Next one. Yeah, you see put? But as Algeria, Lib Libya, parts of uh, Tunisia, that that is the that is the northern Africa. Ethiopia is is, a, is the modern day Sudan. 
Does you see that? If you open the bombs, everybody see that? Okay, these are the nation that are mentioned in the Bible. And I'm going to stop right there because I didn't notice what time it was. So come on up, Ronnie. I will, I will wrap this up in two weeks. And it gets pretty good. It gets pretty deep. So you got to kind of pay attention. Amen. Stand to your feet, give Lord a hand, clap of praise. Amen. Sorry I lost track of time, but hey, it's interesting. And I want y'all to be prepared for the king soon and very soon. If you need something from Christ, if you need something from Jesus, we're going to open up the altar. Just come on down. If you need to be saved, if you need to be healed, the Bible says call on the elders of the church that they may lay hands on you that you may be healed. I believe in signs, wonders, and miracles. Whatever it is that you are going through, if you just need a, just, just a touch from Jesus, 